Alan, how do you how do you dance to, to this song? I always uh, like to dance just like Sal and I. <laughs> where you bend your knees, push them side to side, put your hand like this. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. This is training vlog number 17. Thanks for Alan for dancing us into this vlog. Uh, we've got some form checks. We've got some questions from you guys. and We've got a bunch of our training videos from uh, New York. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into it. First question is from Matt Palmieri. He says, I noticed that the Barbell Medicine crew rarely if ever prescribes mobility drills for any technique issues. Usually technique is not related to mobility. Uh, for instance, if a person has poor mobility in the thoracic spine, it will affect their overhead press. Okay. <laughs> Does optimal positioning usually clean itself up just by learning to perform the lift correctly? Uh, would there ever be a time to prescribe warm-ups with targeted mobility work, or do you just keep warm-ups very general? Uh, so a lot going on in this question, and I think um, you know it's very difficult to submit a thorough question via email. Um, you know, just, just off the cuff. So uh, that being said, I do like this question because it's something that gets asked or a permutation of a question that gets asked all the time. What's up with mobility work? Why don't you guys prescribe it? What are your thoughts on it? You know, this, that, and the other. So the deal is this, the, to get better at doing a lift, you need to do the lift more. Mobility uh, work that uh, I would define as any sort of general stretching or, uh, or, or mobility work about a sp specific joint uh, or something that not, uh, does not represent or does not recreate the lift itself. So for instance, doing bodyweight squats, you could hold at the bottom of a bodyweight squat and that's technically a stretch, I guess, but I wouldn't consider that mobility work. I would consider that squatting. Um, so would I ever have a person hold the bottom of a squat or do more unweighted warmups to uh, get themselves warmed up for the squat? Sure, I don't think that that's mobility work. It's certainly not targeted mobility work. It's just squatting, it's just warm up. And, and our warm ups are not general, they're specific. So that's how we kind of prescribe this. We want uh, specific warm ups to get ready for the specific lift because it gives you a chance to practice the movement pattern, the technique that you're about to be using and, and maybe clean up any form issues that have uh, you know, been, been carried over. You know, the, the second thing that you said in there was that if a person has poor mobility in a thoracic, in their thoracic spine, it will affect their overhead press. Well, what do you mean by poor thoracic mobility? Um, if someone's got structural issues that are causing them to not be able to do the overhead press correctly, well, that's a different deal, but you're suggesting that poor thoracic mobility can be corrected via stretching. And I would actually argue against that. I, most thoracic uh, conditions are fall into one or two categories, broadly speaking, uh, structural or volitional. Volitional, you know, if I sit here like this all day, people say, oh, you know, sitting at a computer is the, you know, is, is you know, death or it's similar to smoking cigarettes and whatever like that. I mean, maybe psychologically, okay, sure, <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to do that. But um, this is volitional because I can stand up straight and I can extend my thoracic spine and, I, and it's not a big deal. The, using the bow tie or any uh, silly, you know, uh, K-tape or, or whatever as a cue to like do this, that doesn't change anything because it's volitional, okay? You could literally do this for, you know, hours on end and be fine, um, you know, because you volitionally can re-extend. So using mobility tools or mobility uh, work specifically to fix that, you're not, there's nothing to fix. It's just a volitional thing. And structural stuff, you're not going to fix. So I wouldn't do anything about that. Um, if then the, the next part of your question is, does optimal positioning usually clean itself up by learning to perform the lift correctly? And the answer to that is yes, you get better at squatting by squatting, practicing the squat. Your mobility for squatting gets better by squatting. Anything that's not a squat doesn't help your mobility in a squat unless it's the squat. And people are like, oh, well, if I go into the gym and I open my hips first by doing this couch stretch and then I do uh, you know this ankle work, then I can squat better than if I just went into the gym and started squatting and I would, uh, submit to you that sure if you spend 15 to 20 minutes moving around warming up your muscles your initial few reps on the squat are going to feel better uh, than 
just going to the gym straight cold and squatting the empty barbell. However, if you spent equivalent amount of time warming up the muscles, the, it's gonna be the same. And on one instance, when you, if you just squatted, uh, instead of doing all this other stuff, you'd actually be practicing the movement that you're about to do, which is more useful. So when should you do mobility work? I don't think that you should do any general mobility work. Um, so anything that doesn't represent the activities that you are either required to do for your occupation or for your recreational pursuits or for your athletic pursuits, uh, uh, or, or if it gets you a date, then you can do uh, you can do mobility work. But otherwise, it doesn't help recovery. It doesn't prevent injury. It doesn't make you more uh, mobile. Uh, that gives uh, and yielding a performance advantage. You know, uh, becoming more flexible via stretching via uh, stretching routines. Uh, influences your neuromuscular system. It allows you to tolerate the positions that you are placing yourself in gradually uh, over time. So if you wanted to do the splits, guess what you would do? Uh, you would practice doing the splits and you would permit yourself to, to get better at the splits over time. But what does that do for your squat? I don't know. What does it do for your sporting performance unrelated to squats or splits? Like, I don't know. It doesn't, you know, it, all it's doing is taking away time and training resources um, from actually either practicing your sport or training. So uh, since it doesn't help with recovery, prevent injury, um, or improve performance, uh, especially when compared to actually practicing the sport or the thing that you're uh, testing your performance on, uh, I probably wouldn't recommend uh, routine mobility work that is generalized. Okay, so I thought that was going to be a fast one, but it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next question is from Jim. He says, I noticed in one of your recent form check videos that you were wearing heels for RDLs, whereas you pull from the floor in flats. Do you recommend heels for RDLs over flats or does it not matter? Uh, also, if yes, do you perform stiff legged deadlifts in heels too? So I don't think any of this stuff matters. Um, I actually, this, these uh, form check videos that you're going to see, uh, Austin and I actually didn't bring our flat shoes and we normally pull uh, one of our supplemental pulls on day four. So uh, we both just pull in, in heels and it's fine. It's just, you know, changes the lift a little bit, but it doesn't, you know, some people would say it activates more quad. That's not true because it takes weight off the bar. So <laughs> it doesn't really help you out there. Um, if anything, the big thing that a shoe does is it has a tendency to decrease the contact patch that you have with the middle of your foot and the floor. So in a pull off the floor, especially a heavy one, like a uh, conventional deadlift or sumo deadlift or, uh, you know, you want the bar to move directly over the middle of the foot. And, uh, you know, a stiff-legged deadlift, since your knees are actually locked out, it's going to be behind the middle of the foot and that permit that, that's a, a, a problem. But for a regular deadlift from the floor, uh, whether it's conventional or sumo, you, the bar is going to be over the middle of the foot. And if you're wearing a heeled shoe, it takes that contact patch from, uh, from being this big and makes it smaller. Um, so, Wearing a heeled shoe decreases the contact that the middle of your actual foot has with the floor. Has uh, That makes a, a tendency to tip forward. That's uh, kind of one of those things that you'll experience when you pull in shoes for the first time. You feel like everything's going forward. Everything's wanting to uh, go away from you. So I think it makes it more sensitive to technique uh, perturbations. And, and so does that mean that you should never pull in, in heels? I, I don't think it matters. You know, if you're never going to a meet, you never need to maximize the amount of weight on the bar. You know, maybe there's a 5% difference, a 10% difference in somebody who's really, really bad at pulling in, in shoes. You know, that doesn't matter if you're never going to go to a meet uh, where the weight on the bar matters more than anything else. It's just, you know, you're still getting a good training effect by using shoes, uh, but it, probably keeping some weight off the bar. That being said, to, to what effect, you know? Um, so I don't think it affects uh, any sort of training outcome like hypertrophy or strength or whatever unless you're testing uh, like a 1RM to evaluate strength improvements. Um, for RDLs, I just like them for from RDL for RDLs because they're lighter, and I'm usually doing RDLs at the end of a session, um, and uh, that's I just do them like that. Stiff legged deadlifts, I've done them both ways. There's no difference. Doesn't matter at all. So the point is this: if anyone tries to make a a, a, a firm case about you should be pulling in shoes, uh, I think that the burden of proof is on them uh, to substantiate any claims that they have. Really, the only argument that I can make is that if you are a competitive Olympic weightlifter or you have a high value uh, sort of, um, you put a lot of value in your performance on the Olympic lifts and you you want to deadlift, which you probably should to get your pull strength up, then you should probably do it in shoes, you know, because that's specific to your sport. But if you are just training for general strength and conditioning, then it doesn't matter. 
you know, you'd want to pick the type of deadlift that allows you the ability to train the deadlift consistently, productively for a long period of time uh, with, you know, the best technique that you can, you can manage. And I don't know if shoes have a significant effect on that, but to the degree they do, you'd want to pick the shoe or lack thereof that allows you to, to have that best, that best sort of style. And so, um, again, I just don't care. <laughs> it's just such a stupid thing. Like, you know, people are, people are geeked out about, you know, you should always wear shoes when you deadlift or novices should wear shoes. It's like, really? Like, I just don't care. If you want me to tell you what to do, here's what to do. Whatever shoes that you had on before you are doing the lift that you're uh, talking about, wear those shoes. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't change in the middle of a, a training session unless you're going to go to a powerlifting meet. If you're going to go to a powerlifting meet, you should probably pull in flat shoes. Yep. There's a, there are multiple reasons why people do not, at present time, pull, you know, limit world record or near world record attempts in lifting shoes. They did before because they didn't know any better. Uh, now we know better. So, there you go. All right, let's get into the form check. This first one is Kyle Tams, 230 pounds. All right. First thing, the elbows are way too high. I would get the elbows pulled down to the side. Head's moving around too, so tuck your chin down. And then that both of those two things are making you far too vertical on the way down. You need to bend over more. You can see your heels coming up a little bit at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, on the way up too. So I would bring your elbows down I would put your chin down a little bit more and I would bend over more on the way down. All right, now we're doing some bench press. This has got to be Corey Grisham, 250 pounds. I don't like that they're clipped and he has no spotter, you know, but and this looks like 230. Yeah, the other thing I can't see is if your butt's actually leaving the, the bench because this angle. That being said, your grip looks a little narrow for a regular bench press grip, so I might try widening it out by a knuckle and then make sure your butt's staying down on the bench press. Otherwise, we're good. All right, last user video. It's 365. That's what it looks like anyway. Also, it looks like, yeah, 365. Put the belt on. I didn't trim this. So we get to talk. Hey, how you doing? So the bar's forward, and yeah, it kicks even further forward. That bar's way forward in the middle of the foot. So I need, I would, your hips right here are in the right position, but the bar's still forward, and then you bring your shins to the bar, kick it even further forward. You can see the bar just roll. So pull the bar back in your stance, raise your hips, don't kick it forward. Yeah, I mean, you just see the bar rolling. So it's forward. It's very light. Very light. So, all right, we'll move on. Hey, this is me and Alan Thrall, double. So this is 585. I jumped to this from uh, 505 and it was a little heavier than I want it to be. I'm wearing shoes, so yeah, intimately relate, intimately uh, familiar with what happens when you put shoes on when you don't normally wear them. Uh, this is supposed to be synchronized, but I think Alan's like, dude, why are you so weak? Yeah, that was a little heavier than I want it to be. The bar is actually coming off my legs too, just a little bit, but that's the main uh, review I'd get. And Alan in the back, the only thing I'd say is when he locked out, if you watch that again, which we won't, uh, I'd want him to make sure to fully lock out his knees. But, all right, so this is back down. This is what, 515, 530? Yeah, it's also super hot. Yeah, so the plates will shift to the side every time you touch the ground. So I was doing these touch and go pause deadlifts. So you can do touch and go deadlifts, um, you know, People say, oh, you can never do them, but let, let, let's let talk about this for a second. So, touch and go deadlifts, the idea is that you're not uh, getting a good um, sort of uh, tight setup for every rep, and I agree with that. So, I don't think that for your competition deadlift that you should do touch and go deadlifts, and I, I don't think actually it's a very good supplemental lift. Uh, I was just kind of playing around with these because the floor was making the weights jump, you know, bounce all over the, all over the ground, and I didn't like that. But I, I think the argument is that you might be able to use more weight for a um, uh, touch and go deadlift than you would be on dead stop deadlifts. And so that would be potentially an overload. Now, I don't think that's true, 
Um, I don't think it's true unless you've just always trained touch and go deadlifts and not trained the dead stop deadlifts. I think they're, you know, whichever one you've trained more, you're likely able to do, to perform better. So it's unlikely that you're significantly better at touch and go deadlifts if you've never done them. It's just like the sumo deadlift thing. It's like, oh, you can lift more doing sumo. It's like, well, not if you've never trained it, right? So I don't think that's a strong argument. And I think that there are better options to overload the deadlift anyway, like chains, bands, um, block poles of different uh, heights and, and stuff like that once you, uh, once you get used to them. So yeah, I don't think the touch and go deadlifts are good for that. I do think that if you're going to do them with a very controlled eccentric, then can be useful uh, for um, tendinopathies, can be useful for um, if, if you're structuring your training um, using some sort of triphasic setup, then that could be a good eccentric uh, uh, sort of focus. Um, so I think that there are some potential benefits to using an eccentrically focused deadlift like like that, but I, I wouldn't regularly program touch and go deadlifts um, on, outside of that, you know, either an eccentric or rehab kind of focused period. And people say, oh, this is radical, whatever. It's like, look, man, you know, there's there's no such thing as a bad exercise, just uh, bad timing, bad application. Um, and so also the other thing I would say is if you're a CrossFitter, you have to practice this and they wouldn't be eccentrically focused. That would just be sports specific practice. But anyway, you guys aren't probably competitive CrossFitters watching this, but Look, you know, we got to be open-minded here. All right, moving on. Uh, Austin's doing pause deadlifts. You notice he pauses like an inch and a half, two inches lower than me. And uh, But this bar's forward. You can see it. it even jumps off his legs. Same thing with this heeled shoe. And so I would have had him raise his hips up, you know. We both just agreed that it was forward after this. Yeah, it's still forward. But it's very strong. That's 505. This is 530. It's even more forward. You know what's weird too is that we're all wearing green and like like gray or black shorts. Oh, that's funny. Much style, but yeah. So since it's forward, you have one you, you have uh, one option that you can do uh, outside of just raising your hips. You can round your back more to get your the shoulders in front of the barbell, uh, so that keeps the hips close to the bar, and you know you can round your back. So that's what you see there. So if I you know if I wanted to be a jerk. I would just have him raise his hips up a little bit and make sure to keep the bar on the legs. All right, so here's Alan. So we'll watch the hips. Hips don't raise before the bar leaves, so it's either light or he's in good position. Looks fine. This looks like 405. Oh, just two? Well, sorry, guys. All right, so here's more uh, rows. <laughs> yeah, so I just do 315. Um, what's funny, What the, the set after this is going to be is going to be funny, but... Um, yeah, so I just try to hit my abdomen and, uh, yeah, I use a little English in there. And I think if you're going to use them as a carryover to the, to carry over to the deadlift then do it done like this, probably a little bit better. Uh, if you're using them for hypertrophy, you know, you can make an argument that this is more fatiguing cause I get, I have to use more weight. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that Austin put on an extra plate. Make sure the sound's on for this. Oh man. I wish I would have known uh, that it added weight. It felt really heavy, but then I thought that maybe I was just nocebo-ing myself. So, and then I looked down after the second rep and saw that it was 405. Well, that was a little more English than I'd like to put in there. Uh, this is 515. This is Monday morning after the seminar. This is about 6 a.m. in my internal clock. So, yeah, that was okay. Uh, here's Alan, this is 420, this is 445, as you'll see in another video. Yeah, so look, his elbows uh, uh, don't move during the rep at all, but he consciously resets them at the top. That's a good thing to draw attention to because I think that people are moving their elbows all around during the rep, including yours truly, but uh, Alan does a really good job keeping his in place. He consciously pulls them down into his sides and keeps them there. Good depth. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, this is Austin, so this is 550. Yeah. All good. I would have rated that RP six, seven, something like that. Yeah, so this is from the front. Um, notice uh, 
how well he keeps his knees out is, you know, he's not actively pushing them out past, past his toes, but he's keeping them right in place. And he's keeping his knees forward out of the bottom so he doesn't shoot his hips back and good morning to squat. So, yeah. I also think that Alan's beard angle needs to make, be the same as his back angle. Like, you know, that's probably true. It's probably a good cue for him. What is this, 390? All right, bro bench. I also, just again, if we could admire Alan's hair and mane for a little bit, I think that's pretty good. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, it could have gone back a little bit more off the, off the chest, but uh, I'm reasonably happy with that for a nice easy single at eight. It's 335, I'm supposed to do these for sixes. Yeah. Yeah, that pause was short. That was okay. That pause. I'm, I'm doing that little bounce thing again. So now that I see this, I just gotta troll myself. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? That was okay. But that was forward. It needs to go back. That's why the last one felt like general badness. Uh, I think the last one, last thing we got here. Oh yeah, some floor presses. 245. This is my third exercise on, on day one. Yeah, some people like putting like a yoga mat or something with a pad, but I don't. Um, and you can do them with your feet up or your feet straight out. Just you shouldn't try to bridge at all. Lift your hips up off the ground. So uh, since this is actually close grip, the uh, bar is going to come down a little lower on the chest. So the elbows come a little bit further forward, more a deduction. Um, that was my third exercise. That was our training as well from uh, Friday and Monday after uh, the seminar. So, hey, if you want us to answer your questions, Send us an email, media at barbellmedicine.com. If you want us to review your form, send it to the same email address. That's media at barbellmedicine.com. Make sure it's shot landscape, 1080p or higher. Get your whole body, the, all the weight in the frame. Do that. And, uh, you know, try to make sure it's 1080p or higher. Anyway, it's Friday. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for all the latest content. Hit us with a comment below. Hit like if you dug the video. See you guys next time. Bye.